You're listening to the Design for Disaster radio podcast with Josh Cormier. Episode 1, Fail to Train, The Sinking of the Ocean Ranger. If you've ever lived on the coast in the northern latitudes during the winter, then you know how miserable the weather can be sometimes. February 14, 1982 was one of these days in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Located on the southeastern tip of the island, seemingly protruding out into the North Atlantic, the residents were subjected to damp, windy, sub-freezing air blowing from the Atlantic Ocean all morning. Between the fog, rain, and snow, it was a difficult day to be outside for longer than necessary. If the weather was intolerable on land, it was even worse in deteriorating 200 miles east-southeast of St. John's in the North Atlantic where the mobile oil rig, Ocean Ranger, was drilling an appraisal well. Weather reports to the rig advised them to expect Category 2 hurricane-force winds of 90 knots and waves as high as 37 feet. With the crew prepared to manage this magnitude of weather and a rig designed to handle it, it is unlikely that anyone on board was concerned. Part 1. The Ocean Ranger The Ocean Ranger was designed as a self-propelled, semi-submersible, mobile offshore drilling unit, or MOD-U, by ADECO in New Orleans, with construction being completed in Japan in 1976. A Mod U is designed to be sailed and navigated under its own power to the drilling location. Once on location, ballast tanks would be flooded to submerge the lower portion of the rig to provide stability for drilling operations. The rig was not designed to sit on the bottom, but rather to levitate in a semi-submerged manner. The Ocean Ranger was designed to travel. After being constructed in Japan, she spent 1976-1977 in the waters around Alaska before sailing to the Baltimore Canyon off the coast of Maryland for operations from 1979 to 1980. In 1980, she drilled off the coast of Ireland before relocating to the Grand Banks of Newfoundland later that year. In order to get to each location, the Ocean Ranger was propelled by four 3,500 horsepower DC motors directing water through two quart nozzles on each pontoon. The rig structure was a drilling platform consisting of two decks that floated on two 400-foot-long pontoons that were 24 foot tall each. The pontoons were located on the port and starboard sides of the rig and connected to the platform via eight columns that were about 150 foot tall. The Ocean Ranger was massive and one of the largest modules ever commissioned at the time. To put the size of the Ocean Ranger into perspective, imagine two football fields side by side perched atop eight columns each as tall as a 15 story building that are floating on two pontoons each the size of a Navy attack submarine. The columns that supported the platform ranged from 25 to 38 feet in diameter, with the four corner columns having a larger diameter. The columns were named according to their position being numbered 1 through 4 from 4 to aft and assigned either a P for port or S for starboard. For example, PC1 would be the forwardmost column on the port side. Each of the four corner columns contained chain lockers that held the mooring chains. Each chain locker extended from the 35 foot level to the 70 foot level. The chains were fed from the lockers through the top of each column. The Ocean Ranger would be moored by support vessels that would position the 12 22-ton anchors in a symmetric pattern around the rig. For rough weather drilling, the rig was designed to withstand simultaneous occurrences of 100-knot winds, 3-knot surface currents, and 110-foot waves. Rigs like the Ocean Ranger were designed to continue operating in adverse weather within certain limits. She was designed with the compensator that allowed her to operate in wave heaves up to 18 feet. Policy on board Ocean Ranger was to stop operations with 15 foot heave or 10 degree horizontal offset. The drilling derrick was located at the center of the platform in order to minimize the effect of rolling and pitching on the drill pipe. Because of these design considerations, drilling was rarely halted for bad weather. When the weather did push the rig beyond safe operating limits, the crew would hang off. Hanging off was simply disconnecting the rig from the subsea stack located on the sea floor. For this procedure, the crew would cease drilling, partially withdraw the drill string, drill string and install a hang-off tool, run the drill string back into the hole where pipe rams would clamp the hang-off tool in place, and disconnect the drill string. In case of an emergency, the crew could also shear the drill pipe in order to quickly separate the rig from the stack. In addition to this, the mooring chains would be loosened to lessen the stress and strain on them from the sea action. Part 2. Exploring the Grand Banks of Newfoundland 
The discovery of the Hibernia oil field in 1979 presented the Canadian oil industry with the potential for over 1 billion barrels of desirable light sweet crude oil. Light sweet crude oil is a more valuable form of crude oil. The less dense, light crude oil is easier to refine into valuable products like gasoline. The sweetness of the crude is determined by its sulfur content. Oil with a high content of sulfur is less desirable as, it's low, as it lowers energy density, is corrosive to metals, and fouls the environment. When Ocean Ranger arrived at the Hibernia oil field in 1980, it was tasked with drilling appraisal wells across the Hibernia oil field. These wells would be used to define the boundaries of the oil field so that oil production could be planned. Within two years, Ocean Ranger had drilled numerous wells and was now drilling a well approximately 200 miles east-southeast of St. John's in 260 feet of water. The crew was experienced in the industry, but because of the rotational nature of shifts on an oil rig, they had not worked together extensively. The crew members worked in 12-hour shifts for 21 days on the rig and 21 days at home. Complicating the normally cohesive nature of maritime crews, the rig did not have one distinct person in charge as would be found on a conventional ship. The Ocean Ranger had two people in charge. The captain of the rig was Clarence House. He had arrived on the rig on January 26, 1982, only about two weeks prior to the sinking of the vessel, and was in charge of navigational operations of the rig as a traditional captain would be. Once in position to drill, the tool pusher would assume command of the rig. For the Ocean Ranger, Kent Thompson was the tool pusher. As the tool pusher, he was the authority for rig activity during drilling operations. In addition to this, he was also a representative of the rig owner, Odeco. Although Captain House had authority over vessel operations during certain times, Kent Thompson could overrule him as he represented the company that owned the rig and was therefore ultimately responsible for its safe operation. From all accounts and actions taken known about the accident, Mr. Thompson had an apparently strong command and control of the Ocean Ranger. Part 3. An Important Job Not Taken Seriously Enough one of the most important jobs on any submersible or semi-submersible vessel is that of the ballast control operator. The ballast control operator controls the ballast system where a single wrong adjustment could quickly capsize the vessel. As a semi-submersible, the Ocean Ranger controlled depth and ballast almost exactly like a submarine. The ballast control operator remotely controlled the amount of fluid in separate tanks located within the vessel. By adding or removing fluids, he was able to control the list, trim, and draft of the vessel. These fluids consisted of fresh water, drill water, fuel oil, and seawater stored in 16 tanks in each pontoon. The fluids would be pumped to and from a tank with valves controlling the path of flow. The ballast control operator worked in a ballast control room located in column SC3 about 28 feet above the drilling water line. An accurate picture of the ballast control room would be to imagine a room with a large switchboard. The switchboard portrayed a map of the tanks, pumps, and valves in the system with switches located on the board relative to where they were in the system. The operator would flip switches as required to power pumps and open and shut valves. Given the importance and complexity of this system, it is unsettling how informal ballast control operations were administered on board the Ocean Ranger. For one, the ballast control operator was not a specially staffed position with extensive land-based training. If a crew member wanted to be a ballast control operator, he could observe and learn from a current ballast control operator during his off time or when operations allowed. After a period of time, a supervisor would evaluate the candidate and then progress him on to an intense 84-hour training course. After this, he would be allowed to stand watch in the ballast control room. On February 6, 1982, about one week prior to the sinking, the crew experienced an incident that emphasized the importance of of taking ballast control operations seriously. Ballast control operator Bruce Porter was sent to tech on a valve in the port pontoon. Captain House relieved him and took over control of the ballast control system. A few minutes after leaving the control room, Porter felt a sudden five degree list. Donald Rathbun, the senior ballast control operator, was off duty at the time and rushed to the ballast control room. Once there, he quickly rectified the situation. The situation had gotten serious enough that the rig's crew had deployed to the life raft stations in preparation for evacuating the rig. After reviewing what had happened, the crew determined that Captain House had opened a tank valve without noticing that a sea chest valve was also opened. This lined up seawater to feed directly into the ballast tank instead of simply moving existing ballast water from one location to another 
effectively sinking the port pontoon. Porter rotated off of the Ocean Ranger shortly after as part of his normal rotation. He later testified that tool pusher Kent Thompson chewed out Captain House in front of an office full of people for his actions. Captain House stated that he should not operate the ballast control system in the future, to which Thompson agreed. Complicating the safe operation of the ballast control system was the lack of standardized documentation of the operating characteristics of the system. For example, the propeller type pumps used to move water around the ballast tanks did not have sufficient suction lift to pull water quickly from one tank to another. As a result, ballast control operators would trim the rig so that water would be forced into the pump, compensating for the relatively low suction lift of the pump. Occasionally, this procedure required a sea chest valve to be opened in order to prime the pump, but shut once the pump was primed. This critical knowledge was verbally shared, but not written in any training or system manual. The most telling symptom of how inadequate the rig was prepared to conduct safe, conduct safe ballast operations was a lack of formal emergency procedures known as casualty procedures. Casualty procedures dictate specific protocols to be followed in the event of a system malfunction or flooding. They should have been present and practiced regularly, or, um, regularly to proficiency, but they weren't. This alone demonstrated that the crew of Ocean Ranger did not view a casualty that could result in the sinking of the rig as more than a remote possibility. History is rich with anecdotes about overconfident systems operators and designers ignoring potential catastrophe until it was too late. The story of the Ocean Ranger is no different. Part 4. Everything was under control. On February 14, 1982, the crew of 84 men were receiving reports and anticipating yet another major winter storm for the season. Although the rig was built to handle severe weather, a storm of this magnitude was a new occurrence for the Ocean Ranger. The storm coming on this day was classified as a major cyclone with winds from 44 to 91 knots and waves from 45 to 50 feet, making it potentially the worst weather the rig had experienced to date. A shore-based company representative was in regular contact with the rig and would continue checking up on the status of the rig during the storm. In addition to this, the 221-foot drilling support vessel, Seaforth Highlander, was placed on standby to assist the rig if needed. As the worst of the storm wasn't expected until the evening, the crew continued drilling during the morning and into the afternoon. The following is a reconstruction of events based on the report from the U.S. Coast Guard. All times are local to the rig. 6.45 p.m. The radio operator aboard the Ocean Ranger reported to shore that drilling operations had ceased and that the crew was able to hang off. 7 p.m. Jack Jacobson, the senior drilling foreman, radioed his analog on neighboring rig Sedco 706. It was not abnormal for crews of the neighboring rigs to be in contact with one another. During the conversation, Jacobson informed Sedco 706 that one of the port light windows of the ballast control room on the Ocean Ranger had been broken because of a wave. He seemed unconcerned by the event and stated that it was just some water and glass that needed to be cleaned up. 8 p.m. Radio transmissions to shore and Sedco 706 communicated that there was possible electrical problems with the ballast control system, but by 8.45 p.m. it is relayed that the ballast control equipment is functioning properly. To those receiving the transmissions, the situation is believed to be fine and under control. 9 p.m. 15 minutes after the last transmission, the Ocean Ranger reports back to shore that they're having problems again with the ballast control system. These problems include electrical shocks and the panel indicating the valves on the port pontoon are opening and shutting. They can't tell if the valves are actually opening and shutting, only that they're indicating as such. 9.30 p.m. The Ocean Ranger reports that it looks like everything is under control again. 10 p.m. The rig foreman contacts Shore. He notes that all equipment is functioning properly and that it's pretty rough out there with waves reaching as high as 65 feet. 10.50 p.m. Sedco 706 notifies Shore that both themselves and Ocean Ranger are going off comms for a few minutes in order to grab coffee. This gives insight into the level of urgency on the Ocean Ranger. It is unlikely that if the situation was viewed as desperate, that the radio operator would have left the station for a coffee break, given that the radio operator was the crew's lifeline to rescue assets. At 11 and 11.30, the Ocean Ranger gives Shore routine position and weather reports. 
The radio reports did not provide any additional commentary about the situation on board the rig, implying that there was nothing noteworthy to report. 12.52 a.m. Over an hour after the last routine report, Ocean Ranger begins broadcasting mayday calls, stating position and that the rig was experiencing a severe list. 1 a.m. The rig foreman calls SEDCO 706 and asks them to broadcast mayday calls on behalf of the Ocean Ranger. He also confirms that they have a severe list, do not know the cause, but are investigating. 1.05 a.m. The shore station notifies the Canadian Coast Guard. The message notes that the rig is out of trim by 10 degrees and increasing to 12 degrees. At the same time, the Ocean Ranger requests that Sea 4th Highlander come in closer. 25 minutes later, mayday calls from the Ocean Ranger cease as the crew prepares to abandon the rig. Part 5. Their Last Chance The Sea 4th Highlander battled enormous seas, high winds, and frigid temperatures to make it to the rig. Through the haze of snow and sea mist, the captain saw the enormous rig emerge. It was still lit, but she was out of trim to a great enough degree that some waves were slamming into the platform lights. Suddenly, a flare was seen. The boat moved toward it while the boat crew scanned the rough sea for any sign of life. After about three minutes, the crew saw a lifeboat moving under its own power. The lifeboat was able to move alongside the side of the Sea 4th Highlander. The crew of the Sea 4th Highlander threw lines to the lifeboat as well as supplemental lines with flotation devices attached. Anticipating an imminent rescue, the approximately 10 occupants began moving to the outside of the lifeboat. However, the shift of personnel to the side of the lifeboat resulted in the boat slowly rolling and capsizing. After being thrown into the water, about eight to nine men clung to the side of the lifeboat. Having shut down one propeller for safety during the rescue attempt, the Seaforth Highlander was unable to maintain position near the men in the water. Seeing their chance at rescue slipping away, the men began to float away from the lifeboat and make their way to the rescue boat. As the men got closer to the Sea 4th Highlander, the crew threw a life raft into the water, but it was too late. Because of the freezing seas, the men were unable to make an attempt to grab it. Once the Sea 4th Highlander was far enough away to safety to restore the port side propeller, she returned to position to look for survivors, but she was only able to find bodies floating in the water. The crew was unable to pull any of the bodies from the water as the motion of the boat pushed the bodies away when she got near. The crew noted that there were many more bodies in the water than those that had come from the lifeboat. For those that had abandoned the Ocean Ranger, this had been their last chance at surviving. Part 6. Wreckage Recovery and Probable Cause The search for the by now sunken wreckage of Ocean Ranger began on February 16th. Using side scan side-scan sonar, searchers were able to locate the rig and survey its debris field within three weeks. The platform and pontoons were found inverted, about 480 feet from the well it had been drilling. The derrick had separated from the rig and was located nearby. This separation was likely the result of the derrick's impact with the ocean floor as the Ocean Ranger capsized. In addition to the side sonar scan, an unmanned underwater vehicle, equipped with both a TV and still camera, was used to further survey the wreckage. In order to gather information for the investigation into the accident, Divers were sent down to gain access to the ballast control room and document its condition. The divers found that two of the four windows were broken, but that all four of the fixtures that were used to close off the windows from the outside were installed. While in the ballast control room, the divers removed the two broken windows, one intact window, one half of the ballast control panel, and all of the solenoid-controlled air valves. After examining the timeline, rig design, crew training, weather conditions, video of the wreckage, and the recovered components from the ballast control room, the investigators deduced the probable cause of the accident as follows. This is from the U.S. Coast Guard report. This is what they said about the accident. On February 14, 1982, the Ocean Ranger was experiencing the most severe weather in her history. Although the weather was severe and increasing in intensity, the crew had no reason to believe that the rig was in danger and were likely comfortable because of their confidence in the rig's stability. The lull in operations resulting in having to hang off would have been frustrating because it would postpone drilling progress, but have also afforded the crew some downtime while they waited out the storm. At some point during the afternoon while the drilling crew was hanging off, 
A wave with a height of at least 28 feet slammed into column SC-3, where the ballast control room was located. At the time, the ballast control operator did not have the isolating fixtures installed in the windows yet. The wave broke two of the four windows. This allowed seawater into the control room. The introduction of seawater into the ballast control room wasn't considered a big problem at first. This complacency may have been the result of the culture on board, which was, as previously discussed, did not take ballast control operations serious enough. From the beginning, the seawater was causing electrical anomalies with the ballast control panel. It is not known whether the ballast valves were actually operating or whether it was only the indications on the control panel that were transitioning from open to shut and back to open. It is known some water was introduced into the four tanks of the pontoons, resulting in an out-of-trim condition. Another catalyst for complacency was the confusion surrounding proper operation of the ballast control system. As stated earlier, the training and operating practices of the ballast control operators was centered on routine operations. Emergency procedures were never substantially developed, leaving the operators and those arriving in the ballast control room during this emergency to improvise a solution and ultimately regain positive control of the ballast control system. One possible solution to the electrical anomalies was to secure power to the ballast control panel. This would have automatically shut all valves as they could remain open only when power was applied to them. Isolating the electricity and thereby shutting the valves would have bought time to troubleshoot and restore ballast control system back to normal operation. However, according to witness testimony after the sinking from former Ocean Ranger crew members, including an electrician, no one could locate the breaker to isolate the control panel. Most thought it was a switch located on the front of the panel. However, this switch only isolated power from the gauges. As the afternoon went on, the crew likely considered an electrical solution to the problem to be impractical, so they moved to manually operating the control valves using brass control rods on hand for this purpose. But here, too, the crew was not able to regain command and control of the ballast system. It was possible to insert the rods too far into the control valve, and instead of shutting the valve, it resulted in actually opening it. The only way to know if a valve was actually open was an indication on the control panel. However, this was not operating, so the crew had no idea whether a valve was open or shut. It is unclear why reports from the Ocean Ranger continued to downplay the severity of the situation on board. It was clear as soon as the crew was in, unable to assert positive control in the ballast system that the rig was in danger. This would have occurred hours before the sinking. Without the ability to maintain the rig level and the pontoons at a predetermined depth, no reasonable person would consider the situation under control, but they reported it as such. It is likely that the crew was unaware of flooding in the forward chain lockers. As described earlier, each of the four corner columns contains large holds for the anchor chains. These holds were not isolated from above and were, as a result, subject to flooding resulting from extreme wave action. During normal operations, water that entered the chain lockers would be pumped out when it reached the bottom of the column, so there was probably wasn't too much concern about designing a system that prevented water from entering in the first place. But with limited control, possibly no gauges, and the forward portion of the rig moving closer to the waves, the corner columns became a potentially fatal liability. Based on the timing of the initial mayday call at 0052 local time, it is assumed that sometime after midnight, the out-of-trim condition increased to such a degree that the chain lockers began taking on water with each wave. This can be deduced given the rapidly changing trim of the rig during the last hour of the sinking, which implies a greater flow rate into the pontoons than from open valves alone. At this point, saving the rig was unlikely with the ballast control system operating normally, but impossible given the current status of the system. Further investigation revealed that it is likely that one of the two lifeboats had hung up on its cantilevered crane. As it did so, it is believed that a portion of the lifeboat was ripped off, resulting in the lifeboat falling backwards into the ocean. It is unclear what effect this had on the occupants, but it can be deduced that the introduction of frigid water into the lifeboat would have complicated the survival efforts of any crew members not incapacitated by the fall. The Ocean Ranger also had a number of life rafts in addition to the lifeboats. However, all recovered life rafts had evidence of significant damage and were deteriorated from age. It is unlikely that the life rafts provided much assistance in surviving the rough oceans and cold water. At the time of the accident, the surface temperature of the water was approximately 36 degrees Fahrenheit. In this water, without extra insulation, a human will only survive for about 15 to 30 minutes. 
A person's ability to function in the water at these temperatures is limited to only a few seconds, which explains the absence of effort by the survivors in the water to attempt to grab ropes and life rings thrown into the water from the Seaforth Highlander after the lifeboat capsized. The crew had some access to immersion suits that were provided by the helicopter contractor for personnel flying to and from the rig over water, but none are believed to have been used. In the end, all 84 crew members were lost. Part 7. A Failure to Train The sinking of the Ocean Ranger demonstrates the necessity for a system that has well-developed protocols for addressing emergencies. These protocols shall be well known and trained to proficiency with regular retesting. Management cannot expect the operators to prevent failure if the training doesn't reinforce the ability to prevent failures and adequately address them when they do occur. The operators should also be intimately familiar with the system they operate to the extent that they can derive solutions to emergencies where none seem to exist. The failure to train in this accident proved catastrophic. However, as we'll learn from the crash of American Airlines Flight 587, sometimes improper training can result in catastrophe also. Thank you for listening to the Design for Disaster radio podcast. For sources, check the description for this podcast.